And now, round of applause, please, for Mick Colby. I'm going to read you something that I wrote about three years ago uh, for a, um, a publication in America called the North American Doctor Appreciation Society. And it's a paper. It's run by a guy who lives in uh, Colorado, I think. I'm not quite sure. He asked me to write something for his, uh, his publication. And uh, the last member, uh, I was hoping to do something with Sophie, but Sophie's not here, so I can't. So you're going to have to put up with something I wrote, I'm afraid. At the end, you'll tell me whether I shall get on with my book about the Brigadier or not. Now, this is the, actually, it's true, this story, because it's the story, really, of my first appearance at a convention in America, the first time I ever got there. And it's actually true, this whole story, what you're going to hear. My first convention in Florida. It's about right. How's the level, all right? Good. Well, this is um, Who and I, and Mr. Ron Katz, who runs this, uh, asked me to do it, Who and I, and this is what I wrote. Brigadier Alistair Gordon Lethbridge-Stewart strode into the ornate lobby of the celebrated Hotel de Longpre, wondering what on earth he was doing on the west coast of the United States of America in the middle of February in extremely hot weather. And by rights, the temperature should have been damn cold or decidedly wet. At best, there ought to have been a distinct nip in the air. Never mind, the brigadier thought to himself, I've always relished the thought of being an ambassador for the good doctor. Now, the individual in question, the good doctor, could not be present at the weekend special event. He was once again absent without leave. Doubtless, satisfying his curiosity concerning yet another aspect of the galaxy. He never seemed to tire of gallivanting across the universe in that somewhat dubious vehicle of his, which resembled one of England's now extinct police public call boxes. As Lethbridge Stewart reached the hotel reception desk, he was astonished to observe a number of people milling about the entrance, half dressed in all manner of unusual garb. Some of the costumes were reminiscent of the outfit worn by the chap who had first introduced himself to Lethbridge Stewart as simply the doctor. Baggy pants, ill-fitting jacket, and string tie. Yes, recall the brig. He kept playing his flute whenever you tried to get some sense out of him. Others in the hotel foyer resembled the tall, dandified fellow whose passions were for fast cars and gadgets of any kind. A few reminded him of that very amiable, blonde young man with whom he shared an adventure during his sojourn as a maths teacher at a public school in the West Country. The West Country. <clears throat> but for the most part, the people whom Lethbridge Stewart observed were dressed like that other chap with the curly brown hair and saucer blue eyes who brought to mind Harpo Marx. <laughs> and of course, they all had that interminably long, multicolored woolen scarf, which had been such a hazard during moments of stress in that business with the giant robot. <laughs> it was while Lethbridge Stewart was recollecting the events of that particular episode in his career that he was thunderstruck to observe four women coming toward him all four were sporting the uniform that he himself had worn in his earlier days with unit. <coughs> Not only did they all display that bothersome beret, which he had never cared for, but these ladies even had false moustaches painted on their upper lips. <laughs> it was then that the brigadier felt in need. <laughs> Fortunately, the bar was close at hand. <laughs> Since he had had little exposure to American spirits, he invited the barman's advice. Yes, sir, was the reply. We do serve wine by the glass. Have you tried our rosé? 
expecting something from the Provence in France. Lethbridge Stewart was fascinated to taste something which he was informed came from the Napa Valley, whatever that was. He was just reflecting how smoothly this delightful beverage descended when a voice came from behind. Are you enjoying that, Brigadier? The most certainly he replied, swinging round on the bar, to face what he could only regard as a transvestite version of his younger self. <laughs> May I buy you another one then, inquired the brunette, young lady. Well, not having been propositioned in this manner before by a perfect stranger, he demurred. Uh, particularly since Lethbridge Stewart was nothing if not old fashioned, and accepting drinks from American ladies who presumably were impersonating him by their appearance, I mean, confused him somewhat. But then his good manners took over and he courteously acquiesced. It was then that other people hove into sight. And soon he found himself quite the center of attraction. Now all this was somewhat overwhelming since Lethbridge Stewart was by nature a reserved man. These reserves, however, were quickly broken down by the very genuine enthusiasm and hospitality being showered on him. It was a few glasses later <laughs> that it occurred to him that indeed a shower was what he most needed. <laughs> Accepting an invitation to dinner, extending his thanks to all his many hosts, the brig excused himself and went up to his suite. Very spacious, he murmured, as he surveyed the scene upon entrance. But where's the bed? Eventually, he discovered that the widest bed he had ever seen descended to the floor level out of the very wall. Rather like that Bob Hope film, The Cat and the Canary, he reflected. Supper was not in the hotel, but a rather posh restaurant some 20 minutes away. And what an experience that drive was. I mean, he thought Sergeant Benton was reckless enough at the wheel, but the Americans did it on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> However, the food was excellent, if rather copious by British standards. The company was charming, although he found himself rather outnumbered since all three of his dinner partners were female. Not that this didn't please Lethbridge Stewart. It did. I mean, he was flattered. But he had always been accustomed to the company of men in the regimental mess. And during his time in Great Britain and Geneva, the ladies' nights had been few and far between. But returning to the hotel, the brigadier turned in early. Jet lag. It had been a long night from Heathrow, and he was tired. He slept soundly and awoke the next morning ready for breakfast. He was not disappointed. Scrambled eggs and ham, toast and coffee, preceded by the luxury of fresh orange juice. Just what the doctor ordered. Sorry about that. <laughs> Soon he was joined by the organizers of the Khan, as they called it, in order to plan the sequence of the day's events. Mm, another working breakfast, he mused. His duties were extremely light, particularly compared to the problems of dealing with the invasions of Cybermen, Yeti, giant maggots, and the like. The schedule was at last, uh, the schedule was as follows. A lecture to the assembled company, describing details of various adventures with various doctors, insofar as the official secrets acts permitted him to discuss classified information. Followed by a question and answer session, in which, as he was later witness to, no holes were barred. The brigadier discovered that Americans can be very direct, whereas the British are rather frightened of showing their feelings too quickly. Americans suffer no such inhibitions. Not for the first time it occurred to him that Queen Victoria had a lot to answer for. A thought which made perfect sense considering that Lethbridge Stewart, like his father, was a born Edwardian. Next on the agenda, there was to be an extended signing session. This proved to be a new departure. Lethbridge Stewart was used to affixing his initials, authorizing innumerable courses of action in any given situation, but to actually give an autograph to five or six hundred people over a period of two hours or so was quite a novelty. Mind you, 
the recipients were always solicitors. Have you got Ryder's cramps yet? He found them asking. The brigadier shook his head. No, but my neck could do with a massage. He was gratified to find that there was no shortage of volunteers for this particular task. <laughs> the top priority was to, is, uh, to ensure that everyone got their photographs or books signed. When this was accomplished, Lethbridge Stewart leaned back in his chair. Can I get you something, sir? A voice inquired. Well, that's most kind of you, he replied. Uh, some more of that delightful wine from the Napa Valley would go down a treat. And it did. <laughs> Later in the day, there was a press conference. Now, this consisted of many pictures being taken and a battery of additional questions about the exploits of the men and women of unit. Some were critical of the difficult decisions that all military commanders have to make. But many were laudatory. The brigadier explained his feeling that from time to time, politicians make life complicated for the professional soldier. Above all, he continued, the doctor is the force for good. He, Lethbridge Stewart, always hoped to be on the side of the angels, but like any other human being, he was prone to error. He reflected briefly on the appalling loss of life in two world wars, and on the number of unit personnel who also had given their lives in the service of humanity. Mm -hmm. Paraphrasing his own sentiments in another context, he murmured, splendid chaps, all of them. As the reporters tidied up their notes, Lethbridge Stewart thanked them, rising to his feet in acknowledgement of their kind applause. Now, his final assignment was a cocktail party, before the necessary packing in order to catch his flight back to Blighty. Again, hospitality, consideration, efficiency. Luggage checked in, time for one more refreshing glass before boarding the plane. As he settled into his window seat prior to the first class service, inevitable on the world's favorite airline. The brig looked back on the events of the weekend with satisfaction. It is certain, he thought, that I shall be returning to America. In fact, he found himself already anticipating that occasion when, winging his way west over the Atlantic, he would utter that time-worn phrase. Here we go again. Yes. I travel sort of uh, with essentials of uh, reading, but I've done it, I think, before in Spindle and Elsewhere, Ian Martyr's uh, story about the Brigadier. And um, I thought, well, since I've done that several times as Americans, several times over here, i read something that Nick Courtney had wrote, although, um, as you know, Ian, who I miss very, very much, um, was great fun. And we did that uh, in America once, he and I both read the thing that he wrote. He did it a totally different way, which was absolutely fascinating. Anyway, um, to end on a lighter note, um, thank you very much. I hope it wasn't too long and boring. It probably was. Now, I've got a part of the delivery, which was very imperfect. Um, uh, I won't ask a question. I've got a thought, though. Um, Shall I write that book about the Brigadier? Yes! yes. All right then. <laughs>